The Unshackled Waves, episode 160. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, if you've been watching any news channel over the past 48 hours, the biggest story in the world is the historic meeting between United States President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Singapore. We've been glued to the news here at the Unshackled office, watching every development, so I thought we should do a special show analysing the summit with our Melbourne Bureau Chief, Melbourne Munro. Welcome to your first appearance on the Unshackled Waves. Great to be here, Tim. Thanks. Now, of course, there's been a lot uh, that's happened in the in the past a year to, uh, in the lead up to this uh, summit. So we should we should do a brief rundown of that. And uh, of course, tensions were were quite high towards the the end of last year. Uh, North Korea claimed that they had a nuclear missile that could hit the the U.S. territory of uh, Guam. And uh, of course, uh, Trump uh, fired back saying that North Korea would be destroyed with fire and fury. There was his he's got a bigger nuclear button and uh, he also said uh, taunted uh, Kim that he was fat yeah and we've all heard the old rocket man um, insult as well um, yeah it was definitely a like a big war of egos a big clash of egos there um, and yeah the whole world was basically expecting well not the whole world but the um, the left side of politics was expecting World War three obviously um, and this this was even this idea was even present during the Trump campaign uh, against Hillary when, like, the left was saying, like, if he gets elected, like, what could possibly happen with the career situation? Well, the, I remember watching it because I watch a lot of the, the, the comedy shows and they, they were all getting down in their uh, mock war bunkers saying, Trump's going to get us all, all, all killed. But it, it's now been a massive turnaround. Now they're saying, oh, he's being too nice to, to Kim Jong-un. Uh, you can uh, never never win. But, uh, of course, uh, in North Korea, the, the reason why they, they keep uh, ramping up their, their nuclear program is because they, they, they know that or previous uh, US presidents have always capitulated, uh, given them uh, more aid uh, uh, to, to feed the, or well, it's alleged that it's going to feed the, the starving people of North Korea, but always gets si- siphoned off elsewhere. So uh, Trump, of course, uh, was, was always going to was always going to approach uh, for, uh, foreign affairs in a different way. And uh, of course, it's this famous uh, art of the deal. Uh, you, you start from a position of strength and then eventually get to the situation where he wanted to. Right, yeah. And um, yeah, Trump's definitely handled this a lot differently and a lot better. And it was one of his promises during his campaign to stop playing the whole world police thing that America would start to be more focused more internally rather than externally on countries like North Korea um, so it's 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 good that they've that he's opened up this negotiation after all this time yeah and let's let's be clear the the North Korean regime it wants to survive I mean nuclear uh, annihilation is is not in its interest so I think we everyone just needed to, when the the insults were, uh, were flying between the, the two leaders. There, there wasn't going, uh, Kim Jong-un wasn't going to launch a nuclear attack just because Trump said some mean mean things about him. I mean, it's, it's self-preservation. Uh, That's why they've got this uh, nuclear uh, program. The, the old uh, adage, mutually assured destruction, is the, the best way to uh, survive and, in, in some cases, uh, ha- have peace. And like I mentioned, uh, uh, previous uh, U.S. administrations have just sort of try and uh, kick kick the can down the road, made the the problem go away. But what got uh, uh, the North Koreans to the negotiating table was the fact that the sanctions against North North Korea were uh, f- uh, finally enforced by Russia and China, and that was because Trump put pressure on them through other uh, diplomatic means, through uh, obviously his uh, tough talk on trade. So there was a lot of other things that were, that, that were going on to, to make sure that Trump could put North Korea right where he wanted them to. Yeah, it's definitely got something to do with trade because um, Trump has been putting a lot of pressure on particularly China. And China is basically America's 
um, communication, one of their main communication lines with North Korea. And North Korea sort of depends on China for a lot of things. So it's, yeah, we can definitely see, um, we can definitely see the relation there. Uh, China, they've always liked North Korea being there as a sort of buffer between uh, uh, them and uh, the US al ally of, of, of South Korea, which I think is, uh, is really poor. I mean, you're prepared to have these uh, like 20 million people living in famine, terror, ju just, uh, just so you can have a bit more uh, influence in the region. I mean, well, I guess it just shows what the, the Chinese government's all about. Yeah, exactly. And if they can put another country in the way of like the destruction, the nukes and all the wars and stuff, it's just like the, the proxy wars of the, the Cold War, like Russia using Vietnam and Russia using North Korea again to spread the ideology of communism. China's doing the same thing, using Korea as sort of the, the, um, the violent, like the hitman to do all the dirty work, supposedly. And so basically because Trump wasn't going to pander to the North Korean threats and the, the sanctions actually stuck this time, the, the North Koreans, they're actually now, oh shit, we're, we've done all this posturing, we're, we're not following through, we've been uh, exp exposed here as making these hollow threats. And of course that's why they've now decided to, to go to the uh, negotiating table and of course uh, uh, this includes with with South Korea as well. The the two Koreas uh, marched together at the recent Winter Olympics, which was in Pyeongchang in in South Korea, and they had a, a joint uh, a women's ice hockey team. Uh, and of course, there before uh, this uh, big meeting, there was the the meeting between Kim Jong Un and the uh, South Korean President uh, Moon Jae In uh, in the demilitarized zone. They had two meetings, one in April, one in May. It was the first time that a North Korean leader had been on South Korean territory since uh, the, the Korean War. And it's important to, to make the point that the Korean War has not ended. There, was, there wasn't a peace treaty, there was just a, a ceasefire. That's why uh, the, the US has 30,000 troops in South Korea, uh, because it's, it's, it's still a somewhat of a war situation. Yeah, by technicality, these two countries are still at war. Like, it's, it's really crazy to think but that's that's what the treaty says. It was only a ceasefire. But it, look, it, it, it's really great to see them um, coming together for the the Winter Olympics, and it, it shows that the Olympics, um, it it's great to have. Like it's a it it unites the countries around the world for for sport, something friendly. Yeah, it's good that the two Koreas marching together, it wasn't just a piece of virtue signaling, it's, mm. it's actually something of substance came from it. Yeah, and to, to make that gesture, I'm not too sure whose idea it was, whether it was the South or the Norths, but to, to come up with that, that idea to march together, like that would have been, um, that would have just shown, shown the other leader, um, like the, the good intentions. And of course, uh, when they, they met in the demilitarized zone, they signed the, and I hope I can pronounce it properly, the Panjumon Declaration, which uh, includes for full denuclearization of the Korean uh, peninsula and possible uh, opening up between the two countries with even uh, reunification some, sometime down the track. And that, I think, should be the, the ultimate goal. I mean, uh, the, the two Koreas are the same. Uh, people, uh, there was obviously families split up in the in the Korean War, and uh, first, obviously, we want the 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 North Korean people to <laughs> be free, be free of this um, communist terror that they're, that they're currently I experiencing. Um, if North Korea can be opened up, that's a, that's a good first step. Yeah, definitely, it's going to be really difficult, um, particularly if you want to fully reunify both the countries because they're just they're very culturally different i mean if you look at south korea it's a it's a very industrial capitalistic sort of society and the north is well we don't really know too many details but it's been under a dictatorship for so long the the freedoms of the people allegedly aren't aren't as the people there aren't as free and they've been living in a different culture a different um, sort of set of rules, different administration for so long. It's going to be really 
interesting to see if they do choose to reunify it, um, how they're going to get along culturally. It's similar to like East and West Berlin. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you they mention that because North Korean defectors who end up in South Korea, they're actually not treated very well by the local uh, South Korean uh, population. There's this suspicion of them. Uh, they're they're actually shorter than than South Koreans. They're sort of viewed as the the, the bogans of of Koreans to, to to use a phrase. So there is a, actually a bit of prejudice against them. Right. And unifying those countries and bringing those people together, it's going to most likely open up more prejudice. I mean, you might see, because the people will get to know each other more and they'll be more prejudiced in, like, say, the media, in, in culture, art, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it'll be, well, we're getting quite ahead of ourselves there, but <laughs> um, yeah, obviously these practicalities it'll be interesting to see they unfold but yes let's uh, go back to uh, the summit so after the uh, North Korea South Korea meeting then uh, the the big face-to-face -face meeting between Kim Jong-un and uh, Donald Trump was was on, was on the cards and Singapore was agreed as a neutral uh, location it it was it looked like it was going to be cancelled at one point because uh, the North Koreans they were triggered by comments by Vice President uh, uh, Mike Pence, who said, you know, uh, to North Koreans, you better give up all your nuclear weapons or you'll end up like Gaddafi in, in Libya, which they didn't like. And uh, Trump's response to uh, North uh, North Korea withdrawing was like, fine, you, you you walk away. Like, you're not that important to me. And then North Korea's like, oh, no, 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 we, we actually do want to meet. Yeah, I think that was very inappropriate for Pence to say, um, especially because it's such a fragile issue, really. I mean, these people... Kim Jong and um, Donald Trump, they've been back and forthing for so long. And like th these, these are two respected leaders of their countries. Like they, they have egos and they, they don't want to be disrespected. And what, what Penn said is definitely inappropriate. Well, it didn't derail the, the summit. Of course, uh, Tuesday morning Australian time, 11 a.m., uh, that's when the, the first face-to-face uh, -face, uh, happened. We, we saw it on, on TV. It was a very surreal moment. These, these two uh, world leaders who have been uh, at, at each other's throats, or albeit through the internet and diplomatic channels, uh, finally met. And it was all of, yeah, they, they were very uh, polite and cordial to each other. It was also interesting watching the, the the news coverage. The amount of camera clicks. The the media was just in a in a frenzy. Yeah, it definitely was, um, and yeah, it, it's such a historical moment that seeing those two just come together, um, stepping out in front of the flags and just shaking hands. We have to remember that Trump's uh, he he's he's done this uh, switch before uh, if, uh, with our own uh, prime minister. There was the infamous phone call between Trump and Malcolm Turnbull, where he, Trump said, "This is the worst phone call I've had uh, mm. uh, uh, today," and hung up in a in a flush. And uh, uh, Turnbull, uh, uh, what was reported in the media, he wasn't going to be. Um, in his words, uh, bullied by, by Trump. This was over the uh, asylum seeker uh, swap. Uh, but uh, when they met up in person, Turnbull and Trump, uh, they, they were all great friends. Yeah, it's really weird, isn't it? Um, but I, I suppose you've got to be civil at the end of the day. I mean, it, the same thing happened with Putin. There was a lot of hate between both sides. But when they met, it, was, it seemed pretty, pretty calm, pretty friendly. Yeah, so it's maybe it's just a maturity thing. Well, Trump said the meeting was uh, very, very good and went better than expected. And he even heaped uh, praise on Kim Jong-un, uh, telling uh, US uh, TV host Greta Van Susten that he's got a great personality, he's a funny guy, he's smart, he's a, he's a great uh, negotiator. And uh, this is why the left are now saying, oh, you've legitimized this uh, f uh, dictator in the, the, the eyes of the world. But in reality, it's just Trump being on the, the charm offensive because uh, I think part of what Trump wants to wants to do is because they're in Singapore which is one of the uh, the richest countries in Asia they've got a high standard of, li of living sort of wants to say to Kim look you can 
open up your nation to, to all of this, you can be the, the hero uh, of, of North Korea. But yes, he's done horrible things. He's killed his uncle and, and half-brother, and, and, the, and the country is still uh, in a state of famine and, and terror. But you've got to think of the, the bigger picture here. Uh, I mean, if if uh, Trump can woo Kim Jong-un to, to open up North Korea, then, you know, it, it's worth having to say, you know, they suck up to him a bit. Yeah, and I think this has definitely been a step in the right direction. I mean, Kim, no other leader before Kim Jong-un has even tried to, to do something like this, to open their country up. And it really does show that Kim Jong-un does care for his people and his country. He wants to see his country succeed. He wants to open up to the ideas of modern civilization, if you may, to, to what he, he might see in Singapore. And of course, one of the, the sideshows of the, the summit was uh, Dennis Rodman. Uh, for, for those Australians who don't know Dennis Rodman, he was a famous uh, NBA uh, basketball star with the Chicago Bulls when they were winning everything in the, the 90s. Uh, Kim Jong-un actually invited him to, to North Korea a few times uh, b uh, because he was a big uh, basketball fan. And Dennis Rodman said oh, he got on well with Kim Jong-un. Now, he was mocked at the time, Dennis Rodman, for, for, for going going over and thinking that you know it was, a, it was a really great experience there but he was interviewed by uh, CNN Dennis Rodman he had a make America great uh, again hat on a hat also had a Bitcoin uh, sh sh shirt on and he was breaking down saying oh it's this is such a great moment in in world history and to think that I uh, played uh, a part in it and Chris Cuomo the uh, CNN host was just, just a bit stunned yeah it was definitely a I mean Dennis Rodman definitely deserves some credit for this because it, it's sort of, it, he's been like a, a bit of a middleman, like a, a more personal middleman between um, Kim Jong-un and Trump. And he even stated that he tried to speak to Obama about it, but Obama just didn't want a bar of it for some reason. Um, but yeah, Trump, Trump listened to him. Obviously, Trump is like, he's more open-minded, uh, you would think, than Obama. Um, he listened to Dennis Rodman, and now this is what it's led to. Now, there was a, a clip that I saw last night on Facebook. It had um, Sean, Sean Hannity uh, yesterday talking about what, what a great moment this was, Trump talking to North Korea. But then it has, back in 2013, Hannity saying uh, how, um, uh, how terrible Obama was for uh, negotiating with Iran. And, and that's that's been... A criticism pointed out conservatives if Obama was was doing this we'd say that he's uh, sucking up to uh, our enemies but but let's remember that uh, uh, Trump to, to get this situation because Obama's style was basically to apologize for yep. for US strength all throughout all throughout the world mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Trump it's it's been basically getting North Korea to come begging to the to the table I mean there's a big difference in, tw in between the uh, the, the position that uh, Trump's got North Korea in and uh, what Obama got uh, with nations such as Iran. Yeah, Obama just loves to apologize, doesn't he? Um, even when he's still at war with the, the countries he's apologizing to when he's still bombing them. Um, but yeah, Trump, like he's, he definitely takes a more practical approach. Like he's very hands-on. Like he doesn't, he's not all about the the speeches, even though like he, he's very good at them. Um, he like he like you said he's it's the art of the deal he likes to be in the negotiation room and that's that's what he has been doing since he got to power uh, some uh, conservatives such as ben shapiro uh, did say that uh, trump uh, gave away too much because they signed a a document uh, trump and and kim which uh, north korea pledged to uh, denuclearize which they have promised to do before and uh they, they've they've said that they've already started to destroy some nuclear test sites. There's still a long way to go, and in return, uh, the the U.S. Uh, will stop uh, joint military exercises with with South Korea. Some people thought that's that was giving too many concessions, but the the sanctions uh, still remain on North Korea, and I'm sure that uh, if 
North Korea renege on the deal in any way, and Trump will be will be watching it closely, then he'll have no hesitation in uh, re restarting those those joint exercises. Absolutely, I think that's ridiculous. I think it's the opposite way around. Like Korea's given uh, North Korea's given a lot to us. Like they've already started allegedly denuclearizing their country. Um, and like you said, Trump's kept the sanctions on. He's kept the troops there, even though he's promised to remove them eventually. So, yeah, I don't think America's really given the North anything at all. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, the the sanctions uh, still remain. That's the uh, that's the big one. That's what's crippled North Korea and brought them to the table. And as I was saying before, Trump can go back to the tough talk, call him uh, Rocket Man or or, or or whatever, if North Korea uh, tr tries to dud him again. And it's it's one thing to uh, dud uh, Barack Obama. Uh, George W. Bush or Bill Clinton, but it's another thing to to dud Trump. I mean, look at how he's eviscerated uh, Canada this week over over trade policy. Like he has no hesitation in doing that to friends. Imagine what he's going to do to <laughs> North Korea. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, friends and neighbors, um, Justin Trudeau. I mean, he's Justin Trudeau has just been pushing it for a very long time with with Trump on a number of things. Uh, but yeah, obviously the North Korean situation is slightly more serious as it involves nukes. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Someone who's threatening the the lives of people in the US is is going to feel the wrath, like Trump said. And this is only the the beginning. It was it wasn't the end. I think one of the the headlines is it's the start of the deal. I mean, we're, we've yeah. got to see North, North Korea um, complete. Uh, follow through with their denuclearization uh, obviously under strict international uh, observance where we're nowhere near peace yet but yeah it was the first meeting between a sitting US president and a North Korean leader it was it, it, it was a pretty surreal uh, moment and it's it's definitely worth celebrating absolutely it's it's history in the making right there it's yeah. amazing to to watch live yeah. And of course, the the leftist tears have been great. They're they're triggered that uh, Trump is getting closer to peace with with North Korea than uh, any uh, progressive. Uh, I think one of the uh, the funniest memes I saw is that uh, Trump cures cancer, and there's all these signs saying, uh, you know, we have we have a right to die from cancer. Yeah, exactly. And there there was another one. It said something about yeah, like if Trump gets. America nukes, then all the, the leftists will be right in the sense that like he, he has created a war, he has destroyed the country. It's, it's, really, it's really petty, but I mean, that's what you can expect from the left. We've got Bill Maher saying that he hopes the economy crashes so that they can get rid of Trump. Like how, how bizarre is that? How, how weird? Yeah, and even when Trump's at this historic summit, uh, uh, actor Robert De Niro gets up at the Tony Awards and says, fuck Trump. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it, it just shows, it just goes to show people like Robert De Niro, uh, like, look, he's a great actor. He really is. But stuff like this, like Hollywood, they, they can hell insults that they can say all these petty things, but Trump, like he, he puts the country first. I mean, he, he didn't respond to that tweet until a long time after, and he, he absolutely destroyed Robert De Niro. Yeah, he still had time. Uh, I, I think he confirmed that he hadn't slept in, in 24 hours, even well, though he was, yeah, that's a high stakes uh, negotiation, still had time to respond to De Niro. Oh, but the left is going to need proof of that. They, they need to know proof, solid proof of him not sleeping for 24 hours. Oh, for Trump, sure. he doesn't uh, drink alcohol, doesn't even drink coffee. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But like I was saying, now that now the left uh, they're they're saying that oh Trump's Trump's being too too nice, and um, of course they mentioned the the U.S. Uh, student who was uh, imprisoned and that's uh, right, uh, uh, Otto, Otto. I had it written down, but Otto Wambia. Yeah, yeah, that's Wambia. it. That's yeah, actually it was the anniversary of his death mm. uh, on the twelfth of June. Uh, and the actual day of the summit, so that's that's a real coincidence, isn't it? 
Yeah, and Trump said his death word would not be uh, in vain. Would not be in vain. Uh, and I think Trump, he, tr Trump's, he knows North Korea's crimes. He knows mm. what, what they've not just done to their own citizens, but uh, other yeah. other um, people. And yeah, it's you know just because he's putting on the on, on the charm now. And yeah, the, uh, like I said, the the left they were saying that Trump was being too too mean to to Kim Jong Un, and now they're saying he's being too nice. It's it's like I was saying before. Trump, Trump can never win. Yeah, you can't please them. You just cannot please the left. But that's um, that they won't be pleased until Western civilization is destroyed. Oh, and let's say um, they they only want world peace if a, if a progressive is able to do it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, it's been great to uh, debrief uh, the, the past couple of days with you, uh, Morgan. Uh, if we work in the, the office uh, every day, but yeah, it's the first time I had you on the, uh, on the show. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I've been on a, um, on a panel in a long time. Uh, now, of course, you're a Melbourne bureau chief, so you're uh, traveling around Melbourne uh, filming lots of events. So do you want to just run through um, some of what we've got coming up? Right, so um, I'll start by saying, uh, I'll start by reminding everyone we've got Stephen Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. So they'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by a new events company called Axiomatic Events. So make sure you grab your place before they sell out uh, by visiting Axiomatic Events uh, Axiomatic uh, uh, dot events. Axiomatic dot events. Yeah, we're certainly looking forward to uh, for, forward to the tour, and yeah, it's it's hopefully they're they're going to make some waves while they're here. Absolutely. Oh, it's going to be insane. It's going to be as insane as Milo. Mm -hmm. mm. We're going to be um, live streaming just all over the place. Then we're going to be doing something. We're going to be doing something. Yeah. yeah. And also Axiomatic in uh, Brisbane, they're hosting uh, Political Posting Mama in person, aka Mariki Ranson. That's at Mount Gravitt's uh, Bowls Club, 7pm Thursday the 21st of June. And so tickets can be purchased at axiomatic.event slash political posting uh, mama. And of course, uh, there's another uh, big uh, name coming to Australia in September, former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. You cannot barrage the Farage and he's coming here in September. Uh, visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, and Auckland. Yeah, I'm glad New Zealand's getting the love as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got to give something to New Zealand. Uh, our friends at uh, Right Minds, uh, they're, they're pretty excited about uh, that they're getting a slice of the action as well. So tickets, including VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. What we're aiming to bring unrivaled uh, coverage of is the, the True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March, which is on uh, Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm, uh, beginning at the Royal Exhibition Building. Yep, so that is coming very soon, and both the left and the right have been planning this. Um, the left have been putting posters up everywhere to basically organize the the biggest counter rally they can yeah, and they've been trying to scare migrant areas saying these fascists and nazis mm. are going uh, uh, are going to be on the streets and uh, you must uh, uh, uh protest uh, for, for your own safety but i bet yeah. on the day that the protesters will be as white as possible they'll be as white as snow but the thing is they've been strategically targeting areas with poster runs like footscray that's got uh, a mainly ethnic sort of community they've been trying really fear-mongering um to yeah to try and scare these people into to filling their ranks but yeah we'll see if it works or not it's it's very um it's a clever tactic but it's yeah it's a bit morally um yeah, it's not very moral mm. yeah. and of course if we want to see the the unshackled do uh uh, produce more content, cover more events, uh, please support us on uh, Patreon, uh, which is uh, patreon.com slash the unshackled. Yeah, just um, make sure you support us on Patreon before we get banned from Patreon, like Faith Goldie. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, so, so far so good. <laughs> and of course, if you want uh, the Unshackled merchandise that we wear uh, on the sh on the show, uh, please visit our uh, store, uprightmarket.com, uh, and there's other gear there for, for right-thinking people. So on behalf of uh, me and Morgan, thanks, uh, thanks for your company, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.